Well, thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to be here and a pleasure to uh, not only talk about the security landscape, evolving security landscape of Africa, uh, but to be indeed the kickoff speaker in this part of your course. Uh, let me congratulate all of you for taking this course and taking on this additional assignment. I know you have very busy professional roles at home, uh, and I think it's wonderful uh, that you're taking time out for this additional professional development. Uh, I've been studying Africa since 1982 when I first went to Nigeria. Uh, I've focused on the politics of economic and political liberalization, uh, the politics of natural resource extraction, starting with Nigeria, uh, but especially the politics of state consolidation and boundaries. And that's really where I'll start my lecture today, uh, to talk about the evolving security and state situation in Africa and try to explain why we see at a continental level some of the situations that we see. And I'll start off talking about what a state is. Not a government that occupies a state at any one time, but what is a state? And of course, a state is many things. It builds roads. It provides electricity. It educates young people. But for political scientists such as myself, and I think indeed for security professionals such as yourselves, the most important aspect of the state is the most traditional definition of the state, which is that organization which has a monopoly on legitimate violence. Okay? At a fundamental level, the state is that organization which protects citizens from other citizens and from people outside the boundaries of the state. Everything else follows from that, and the states have to do lots of important things, but if the state is not the legitimate, only legitimate provider of security, then there are troubles which can't be resolved. The thing is about providing security for citizens is that it's very hard and that the basic bargain in the creation of a state is that the state says to its citizens, we will protect you, but you must give up the right of self-protection. That is, it is no longer your role to protect yourselves. You must cede that to the police and to the army. And that is a very difficult bargain because there is nothing more important to people worldwide than security, security of themselves and their families. And they're not willing to give that up to a state whose capital is hundreds of miles away unless they have assurances. And those assurances can only build up over time. That is why the history of state building, and this is a very fundamental message, the history of state building across the world is that it generally takes hundreds of years and that many states have failed. If you look at the history of Europe from, let's say, 1400, 1450 to the present, roughly half the states that were ever created failed and are no longer there. They came apart, they were conquered, they fell apart. Something happened to them only to be replaced by stronger states in a kind of Darwinian evolution so that over hundreds of years states were created. There's nothing natural about the states in Europe, just like there's nothing natural about the United States. They were created over long periods of time through some combination of co-option and coercion. In France, for instance, as late as 1850, more than half the people in the geographic area that now we now think of as France were not necessarily speaking French. They were speaking their local languages. And the French state built France and made, as a very famous book says, peasants into Frenchmen. Africa faces that same challenge. And I think the fundamental security challenge that you and, frankly, people of your generation face is you're trying to build states in 50 years, the age of almost all of your states, which came of independence in the early 1960s, at a historically unprecedented speed. Frankly, it took Europe, Japan, China, 
hundreds of years to cement this bargain between the state and the capital, between the capital and the people. We'll protect you if you give up that right of self-protection. And I think much of what we see flows from that. So if you look at Africa before classical colonialism began in 1885 with the Congress of Berlin, um, what's fundamental is that boundaries were uh, boundaries between states, and there were, of course, many states, uh, were very different than today. Boundaries in Africa in the pre-colonial period were much like medieval Europe. In particular, they were not fixed geographic lines. In, in sub-Saharan Africa, before colonialism, states had zones of authority. The king, the Oba chief, the sultan, ruled a central area, and then his power dissipated over geographic space, depending on how far he could extend out his army and collect taxes. Uh, and there were zones of authority. And sometimes the authority of different states overlapped so that people might have to pay fealty to be loyal to more than one state, to more than one ruler. And it was dynamic. As states grew stronger, their geographic reach expanded. As states grew weaker because of leadership challenges, because they got poorer, because of something else, then their reach diminished. So they grew, they shrunk, they changed over time. They didn't have fixed geographic boundaries. And quite critically, the response of people to unhappiness was overwhelmingly to migrate, OK? Albert Hirschman, a very famous social scientist, wrote a very famous book called Exit, Voice, and Loyalty, where he said there were three responses that were possible if you weren't happy. You could exit, leave the situation. You could voice, stay in place and protest. Or you could be loyal, don't protest. Exit, before 1885, was the overwhelming African option because there was a lot of land and very few people. Of course, the population was very small by modern standards. There was a lot of open land. There were no fixed boundaries whatsoever. So people moved. Uh, whenever there was a war, whenever they were on the losing side, they could leave and try to escape uh, whatever ruler. That was, at a continental level, the international African political system before 1885. There were, of course, Europeans uh, in the African landscape for hundreds of years before that, traders, slavers, and others. They, by and large, played by African rules. That is, they didn't attempt, except in South Africa, really, and a few other places, to establish fixed boundaries. Um, and they tried to play with the economy. So the Europeans, uh, in the 18 second half of the 19th century, the 18, late 1800s, looked to Africa and for a variety of reasons, largely pressures within Europe, finally made the decision that they wanted to colonize the continent. Now what's stunning about the colonization of Africa is that it happened so late in world history, uh, even though Africa is right next to the colonizers, geographically, Europe. Remember, by that time, Europe had not only colonized South America, it had left. So the entire period of colonial history in South America precedes African colonization. Why were the Europeans so late? Partially uh, disease. They couldn't penetrate uh, into the interior. Partially for a long period of time, they couldn't exert military force uh, to defeat local armies and in good part because they didn't perceive an economic advantage uh, in colonizing Africa. Very skeptical that there was much money to be made. Uh, because of forces within Europe, uh, they decided, 1870s, 1880s, that the scramble of Africa was to begin. Uh, and in a relatively short period of time, in the latter part of the 19th century, Africa was colonized, and this map was more or less established. Now, the Europeans colonized Africa 10 million square miles or so. And what's amazing is they didn't fight over it. 
with a few skirmishes here or there. Okay? Remember, they were fighting in Europe all the time, uh, but they didn't fight over the division of this continent. And in fact, it was the largest relatively peaceful conquest in terms of the battle between the colonizers. It wasn't peaceful between the colonizers and Africans, but the colonizers cooperated because they felt at the end of the day that they had to colonize Africa, but they didn't want to fight over it. So they developed a set of rules which were enshrined at the Congress of Berlin, which basically said, if you got there first, no other colonial power was going to contest it. The Europeans managed to colonize and demarcate the continent in a relatively short period of time. Because they were interested, medical advances meant that they could get past the diseases at the coast, uh, and the development of the Gatling gun, the, former, the forerunner of the machine gun, meant that they were now militarily superior to local armies. So, by 1904, really, we see more or less the complete demarcation of the continent, more or less along the lines that you see here. In the next 56 years or so, colonialism develops in some places. Europe, of course, is riven by two world wars. It establishes something of a colonial presence in African countries. But by and large, uh, there's very little money to be made. And most European countries are, uh, are willing to rule Africa with a relatively small forces as the British said in Nigeria, the thin white line. There were exceptions, especially in the countries that had settlers. Kenya, southern Rhodesia, northern Rhodesia a little bit, uh, South Africa, very different situation, and southwest Africa. The settlers built up their own infrastructures and their own armies. By the late 1950s, early 1960s, skipping a lot of history here, but you know it. Um, of course, the pressures for decolonization became very significant. The first thing to note is, as late as 1955, no one was expecting, either Africans or Europeans, for decolonization to happen anytime soon. Most predicted, well, maybe around the year 2000 or so. In fact, the decolonization project was largely completed by 1965 and completed in 1990 uh, when Namibia gained its independence, most countries well before then. So decolonization happened really quickly at blinding speed, with dozens of countries getting independence in a relatively short period of time. Why? You know why. The sweep of freedom and anti colonialism that swept the world, especially after India, Vietnam got their independence, uh, the exhaustion of the colonial powers after finding World War II, and the desire for the United, by the United States to break up colonial trading blocks so that it could have greater economic access uh, to those countries. Therefore, while in 1955, uh, no one believed that decolonization was going to be total. In a few short years, decolonization happened. Ghana, of course, being the first modern African country to receive freedom in 1957. So there was an enormous debate about this map at that time. African leaders universally believed that this map made no sense. Okay? Drawn by the Europeans, for European convenience, about 42% of the boundaries are straight lines, done just because it was easy to connect the dots that way. It divides peoples who might well be together and incorporates people who might not be together. Some of the places are geographically challenged, landlocked, or in general don't make a lot of sense. So there was enormous debate among the young nationalists of that era what to do when decolonization became evident and inevitable about the map. And it got down to a debate between two sides, one led by Kwame Nkrumah, Ghana, and the other by Julius Nyeri of Tanzania. Nyeri argued 
let's all become independent together and therefore we'll be able to change the boundaries at once, create a united Africa and be a powerful continental power. Because he said, if these countries become independent at different times, even small times between them, interests will soon consolidate around each country wanting to be independent for itself and will never create a unified Africa. And the other side was Nkrumah of Ghana. And he said, what did he say? He said, seek ye first the political kingdom and all things will follow. That is, let's get independence as soon as possible and we'll figure out everything else later. Because he didn't trust the colonizers to decolonize and because he wanted power. So, countries sought the political kingdom, became independent in and of themselves without coordinating with their neighbors. And soon there were 48 countries with that map. So the leaders got together at the old OAU, the Organization of African Unity, and they said, what are we going to do about this? We have a map that makes absolutely no sense. We agree with that. Makes no sense. And they looked at the map, and they made a conscious decision that they weren't going to change it. And indeed, they made a conscious decision that the right of self-determination, which Africans had used to argue against colonialism, no longer applied to people within independent African states. That is, if you were a group, an ethnic group or whatever, within a state, you did not have the right of self-determination. It was only blue water self-determination. Self-determination. Self-determination only applied to uh, situations where your occupier was across an ocean. Why did they make this decision? A couple of reasons, many of them good and quite understandable. First, uh, there was no better alternative. Uh, as I said before, there's no such thing as a natural state. I mean, the people who argue these states are unnatural, artificial, they're right, so is every state in the world, believe me. Geographic boundaries, mountains, rivers, are never significant enough to demarcate a state. Nor can you make a state on the basis of people's identity, ethnic identity, because they change all the time. They mutate um, and evolve. I'm sure all of you speak more than one language, for instance. Not only the national language that you operate on on a day-to-day -day basis, but one or more local languages, spoken where your parents were, your region and the like. And you all, we all have different identities. So I'm an American, uh, but I'm also white. I'm also from New York. I'm also Jewish. You know, take your pick and you have as many identities as I do. And what we see over time is human identities constantly evolving. So these maps which try to map out uh, Africa according to different peoples, nonsense, because the people keep changing, and the leaders knew that. So there's no natural state. They have to be created. So there was nothing really better. Second, the African leaders have been traumatized by what had happened in India the previous decade, the partition of the Indian subcontinent into India and, and Pakistan had resulted in about a million people being killed. Okay? Um, that's what happens when you redraw a line. Lots of chaos ensued, and they didn't want that to occur. Third, the entire international system at that point was based on boundary stability. The superpowers routinely interfered in other parts of the world, by which I mean the United States and the Soviet Union, but by and large, both superpowers were very conservative. That is, they did not support movements which tried to change boundaries, because the linchpin of the whole thing was a divided Germany and a divided Berlin. So they didn't want to change boundaries, starting with the superpowers. And you remember as early as 
that early, as late as the early 1990s, the United States was not particularly keen on the Soviet Union breaking up. Superpowers tend to be very conservative. So there was an, internationally, there was a lot of support for existing boundaries, and the superpowers have routinely intervened uh, to protect boundaries. As the Soviet Union intervened in Ethiopia to protect against Somali irredentism, the United States intervened in Zaire, Congo, several times to prevent uh, Katangi's secession and other examples. And finally, and uh, we owe this insight into uh, Boutros Boutros, to Boutros Boutros Ghali, who was, before he was Secretary General of the United Nations, he was an outstanding Egyptian scholar. Uh, he said, you know, the Organization of African Unity is a club of leaders. And they all got together in Addis, and what was their one commonality, which is they each rule the state. And they were afraid if they started uh, drawing, redrawing this map, that some of them wouldn't have states to govern after the dust settled. So, as Nieri correctly predicted, uh, interests soon reified around this map. So, with a very few changes, I would argue the only significant change is the uh, secession of South Sudan, that even Eritrea uh, was finishing up colonialism in some significant ways. This map has remained stable for the last 50 years. That is an incredible accomplishment in terms of the history of international relations. If you look at any 50-year segment in any other part of the world, think about Europe. By the way, the map looked a lot different 50 years ago. Uh, there was something called Yugoslavia. There was something called uh, the Soviet Union. There were two Germanys. There was one Czechoslovakia. Um, and if you look at other parts of the world, and throughout most of human history, boundaries change. Africa, boundaries have not changed. And you know, when people say to me there's a lot of turmoil in Africa, yes, at the domestic level sometimes, but not at the international level. Indeed, what's surprising about Africa is how stable it's been over the last 50 years. And you just think, as I said, boundary change in Europe post-1990 compared to boundary change in Africa. Africa looks a lot more stable. And here is where I believe all the security challenges and opportunities that you face derive from, that this map has remained stable. Because basically what you and your colleagues in your various states are trying to do is something unprecedented in human history. You're trying to build states without changing boundaries. Okay? That's never been done before. Everyone else who's ever built a state has had their boundaries changed. Look at the United States. I mean, we were, you know, changed dramatically over the course of 200 plus years. Uh, France, UK, Japan, China, all these states morphed over a significant period of time. You're trying a new experiment, which is get a bunch of states de novo at the beginning and keep them and develop them into prosperous states where people believe that the capital will ensure security. Not talking about anything else, economic growth, education, infrastructure, all important. Let's put that aside. You're trying to build these states from scratch without the mechanism that most people have used over the last couple of hundred years when states didn't work. Because when states didn't work in the rest of the world, they got rid of them. They divided up, they got conquered, they fell apart, whatever. Uh, so this is, I believe, not often vocalized like this, but I believe this is the African security challenge, which is without changing boundaries, can you do this? So how's it played out in terms of security? Well, what's most noticeable in terms of security over the last 50 years is the lack of interstate war in Africa. Um, most countries, most of the time, overwhelmingly, have peaceable, peaceful relations 
or good enough w relations with their neighbor. That's very unusual in human history. Even countries that could swallow up their neighbors, Senegal, Gambia, Nigeria, Togo and Benin, South Africa, even apartheid South Africa played along, Lesotho and Swaziland, even in cases where there was quite obviously a neighbor that could not physically protect its boundaries, those boundaries have remained stable. Again, that's extremely unusual. And Africa has been much more secure, I would argue, than most other parts of the world at most points in human history because there hasn't been, in, by and large, much interstate war. Yes, there have been wars. Eritrea, Ethiopia, the very complex conflicts in the Congo, some South African adventurism during the apartheid era. That's over now. But by world standards, not much, frankly. Uh, this is partially because the African boundary regime, which the young leaders established, has worked, and partially because the world has changed. Charles Tilley noted, a uh, distinguished sociologist, that the 20th century was probably the first century uh, in human history, despite the world wars, um, where more people were killed by their own rulers than by the rulers of other countries. Okay? Uh, it used to be that you faced most of your threats from uh, outside the borders. In, world, in the 20th century, even with the world wars, Stalin killing a lot of his people, kill, Hitler killing a lot of his people, as well as other people, Mao killing a lot of people. Uh, and that trend has more or less continued in the 21st century, and is certainly true in Africa, that you have much more to fear from civil wars than you do from international wars. So that means the security challenges are very different. By and large, you have not been uh, tasked with fighting or protecting against interstate international wars. You've been tasked with something else, fighting domestic wars and ensuring peace. Now this boundary regime system has been a great benefit to Africa. You haven't had the horrible history of Europe and the continual battles between countries. And that saved tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of lives. The problem has been when states don't work. And there you've had a face an unprecedented challenge because most of the time what people have done throughout history when states don't work is get rid of them. Uh, here in the 21st century, and especially in Africa, when states don't work, we try to put them back together again. The most dramatic example being Somalia, of course. It didn't have a government for a bunch of years, but people still recognize the legal entity called Somalia. Uh, I've been, as some of you have been, to Hargeisa in Somaliland the northwest portion of Somalia, which actually has a working state. Even when there was no government in Mogadishu, the world did not recognize Somaliland independence because it didn't want to break up the territorial integrity of Somalia, even though that state did not exist. That's how powerful this regime is. So when you look at challenges of peacekeeping, whether it be in Somalia, whether it be in eastern Congo, or the other places that you'll operate, perhaps northern Nigeria uh, and other places, you're trying to reestablish order, and you don't have the primary toolbox that other people did, which was changing the boundaries of the states so that maybe something else would work better. Of course, Africa finally tried this uh, in Sudan with the secession of South Sudan, which was recognized a few years ago, and, and that's obviously been a very unhappy story to date, but at least it accorded with human history in that Sudan wasn't working, try something else. For the rest of the continent, you've basically institutionalized failure when states don't work. Uh, the other thing, of course, is the time element. Most African countries have only been independent for 50 years. 
by the history of states, that's nothing. Okay? The United States uh, declared its independence in 1776. In 1861, 75 years later, a greater period of time than almost all of your countries have independence, we fought a brutal civil war, notable for the violence of its time, about whether we would be one country or two. Okay? And believe me, the Europeans, more than 50 years, have had their own share of problems. So 50 years is not much in state time because this bargain between the capital and the individual is so hard to create. And you're doing it without many of the traditional tools of state building. So that's the security challenge. Now, for states that develop, for states that grow, great. They don't face uh, foreign competitors, and it works better. Uh, but in cases where there's endemic violence and institutional breakdown, you have a problem because peacekeepers are trying to establish order and do things which are basically without precedent in human history. When you look at civil wars throughout much of history, because most of violence in Africa is civil wars, um, not interstate conflict, when you look at most, most civil wars and you ask how civil wars end, until recently, until the 1990s, they ended with one side militarily defeating the other side. Someone won. Okay? That's not the solution we look to, by and large, these days. Um, peace building, mediation, third party intervention, uh, these are all the flavors of the day, and sometimes they've worked, indeed. But the reason why most civil wars end with one side militarily defeating the other is because third party intervention is very difficult. Not credible. How long are they going to stay? And the combatants think that, well, maybe we'll go back at it after that third party, the peacekeepers or whatever, leave. So uh, one of the difficulties and one of the reasons you see in African civil conflicts repeated attempts at accords which break down is because you, um, you don't have a force that's inside the country that's committed solely to the military defeat of the other side. Indeed, in general, as an aside, I'll note, the kind of language of victory in most military affairs has been lost in the 21st century uh, worldwide. You don't talk about more or less defeating the enemy anymore, but bringing the situation to some kind of pal palliable uh, solution. What has changed compared to past times, uh, because as I know, much of what's going on in Africa is now is not at all surprising. Of course, states that are 50 years old are weak. Of course, they face people who want to overthrow them. Of course, it's difficult to establish security apparatuses. Other countries took hundreds of years to take on those tasks. A couple of things are different. First, our expectations are different. Uh, I don't think it's acceptable for you to think, wow, in two or three hundred years it'll all work out. You know, that's not, a, uh, that's not a solution. Second, the means of violence have accelerated. The means of violence that are available to common people, starting with, yes, the Kalishnikov, uh, is a, wep is a weaponry that was unavailable to people in past times. And finally, there's much greater global awareness and to some extent global interference uh, than before in these conflicts. Uh, and that plays out these days, of course, in social media. Few final observations about the changing landscape. One is that these boundaries are for real. I mean, I know all the time people say, oh, African boundaries are so weak because I just crossed them one day. Yeah, individuals can cross them. Armies don't cross them, okay? Second, there are some profound changes going on across the continent, which I know you are aware of in your individual countries, but which, um, which uh, should be noted because they, f they affect the security situation. The first is urbanization. 
Africa, 1960, 5% or less of the people were in cities, and the cities were really small. A few years ago, we had first country, we believe, Zambia, become majority urban. We're projecting that almost all African countries will be majority urban in the next 10 years or so. That urbanization is caused traditionally by continual movement of people from the rural areas to the cities, but also now we see that the organic population in cities is significant enough that people just having more children in the cities is increasing the urban population. Um, that second generation urban dwellers are now becoming common in Africa. This is a complete change from traditional African history where people moved away from the centers of power to protest. Now people are overwhelmingly moving to the cities. On the one hand, good for the states because it's easier to control a significant number of people in the urban areas. On the other hand, challenging for the states because suddenly there's a lot more people in the urban areas than there used to be. And inevitably, that scale of urbanization uh, threatens governments which can't deliver nearly as fast. So in little more than a generation, the population balance between the countryside and the city has changed fundamentally. Third, Africa is in the midst of a massive youth population explosion. Almost all of the rest of the world is getting older and having fewer children. In Western Europe, and to some extent the United States, we've reached the point where the domestic population cannot replace itself, and whatever population growth there is, is being provided by immigration. Europe, uh, Japan, population growth essentially negative. African populations are still growing, by and large, because most African women are still having between four and a half and five and a half, on average, uh, children, live births. Um, and so the youth population, the youth bulge in Africa is increasing. The world's population, except for Africa, will, gr will increase. Africa is going to get younger for the next probably 10 to 15 years. And a very significant portion of the babies in the world will be born in Africa. We're projecting that the African share of the world population as a result will grow from the current, call it 12% round numbers to 17% or so. And in your individual countries, there's going to be massive population growth. Um, in Nigeria, 350 million people by the middle part of this century. Uh, in Tanzania, uh, probably in the high 200s. Same with Ethiopia. Many of your countries will see their populations double between now and 2050. Okay, so whatever your population now is, double it. There's virtually nothing that can be done about that. Uh, in Nigeria, the mother of the child who is the 350 millionth Nigerian has probably already been born. Okay? This is going to happen. Maybe through birth control and other things, you'll decelerate the population after that. But you're probably, all your populations are probably going to double in the next 30 odd years or so. Maybe faster. That's going to present a real challenge. Whatever your unemployment rate now is, if you don't create at least twice as many jobs as you have now, it's going to increase. And a lot of those unemployed people are going to be young, and conversely, almost all the young people are going to be unemployed. And uh, that's a big problem. We know one of the best predictors in terms of conflict is the percentage of young men in the population. Okay. Countries which have young populations, and we proxy this with young men, because they're doing most of the fighting, um, tend to have the wars, tend to have a lot of wars. Countries which have young men who are not employed tend to be particularly at risk, and we saw this obviously in the Arab Spring. So you have this confluence of two mega demographic trends. 
the cities are exploding, partially because people are moving there, but also now because the urban population, the organic urban population has just reached a critical mass and can grow. And second, a great number of young people who are overwhelmingly in the cities. That could be great. If your countries take advantage of this youth bulge, young people are dynamic, they're inventive, they're entrepreneurial, appropriate for these days, they're at the cutting edge of technology, of social media. If your countries are able to take advantage of that youth bulge, then your economies will prosper. If for some reason, and there are a lot of reasons to think this, you're not able to take advantage of that youth bulge, and then in 20, 25 years instead what you have is an enormous number of unemployed young men in the cities, that's a whole set of other security challenges. Certainly one of the things that your generation of military professionals and the next generation will have to deal with is that the threat environment will change, at least in part, from the rural areas. What's happening in the mountains? What's going on out there towards security challenges which emanate in the cities? And I think that's a separate set of issues and that has to be thought about at great length. Um, but I think it's coming because that's where the people are. And finally, the globalization of everything affects Africa in lots of positive and negative ways. Uh, on the positive way, you have opportunity to engage in an international economy which is dynamic to take advantage of technologies unheard of only five or ten years ago and to leap forward in significant ways. Certainly in the time that I've been studying Africa, the most significant change has been the cell phone which has revolutionized so many things, and the revolution has only started. On the negative side, globalization also brings conflict. Conflict spills over from other places. People who are protagonists in different conflicts come to your countries to seek haven. People fund those conflicts through the illegal trade of uh, arms, narcotics, uh, animals, trafficking of women. Uh, there are a lot more opportunities than you like. Uh, external populations, which provide remittances to your countries for the good, but also f sometimes fuel conflict for the bad. And finally, the greater ability to communicate is a mixed blessing. I mean, it's obviously great and allows you to participate in the international economy, but it also allows combatants and highly decentralized forces to communicate much better with each other, and also for worldwide networks of terrorists and other, others to coordinate and to build their forces. So the globalization of everything both is a tremendous opportunity and a tremendous challenge to the security of Africa. My students, and I'll conclude here, often ask me, well, how's Africa done? And I'd say the mega trend is the increasing differentiation across the continent. Fifty years ago, uh, when most countries received independence, the, uh, you know, many countries had many of the same characteristics, including nascent militaries. Now, of course, 50 years on, because of the decisions made by different leaders, because of different circumstances, different resource endowments, countries are much further apart uh, than they were before, and that differentiation will continue. That's not a particular surprise. No continent ever uh, develops in lock formation. But otherwise, I'd argue, on balance, the security situation in Africa is not particularly surprising, given that state creation is such a difficult thing. But what is of enormous challenge is that the Africans, you, have gone down a route whereby state development and especially addressing failed or dysfunctional states is going to have to be done in a very different way than in most of human history. You know, so you've avoided the interstate wars that the Europeans had, Asians had too, for most of their history, but you've brought yourself a different set of problems, uh, many of which I know you deal with in your professional careers. So thanks very much uh, for uh, allowing me this opportunity to participate, and I look forward to your questions.